Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Spike T. Smith. Spike, welcome to the show. Hey, Bart. Thank you for uh, inviting me on the show. You yourself are a very prolific punk drummer, um, and beyond that, I'm sure more more genres, but uh, you have a very, very vast knowledge of punk drumming, and we've really, on the show, haven't talked much about this awesome genre, which I'm a big fan of. We're talking specifically about the D-beat, which you have created an awesome documentary about, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But I think before we start, what would be a good idea is for me to drop in some audio of you playing the D-beat, and then people can actually hear it, and then we'll hop in and talk about it. So let's hear this first. All right, so people just heard it. So now you, I think people know this rhythm. They've heard it a lot. Um, while we're starting here, let's kick things off. Why don't you define what the D-beat is? Well, the D-beat um, is a very specific pattern that's created between the bass drum and snare drum. The name comes from the band Discharge, which you, you could call the originators of the style and of the rhythm. I mean, it's it's not true to say that, you know, the drummer Tez Roberts, who is the original drummer of this jazz, created a completely unique rhythm. It's it's a rhythm that, sure. you know, has existed, well, probably since tribes in Africa started hitting things, yeah. you know. Yeah. But what's really happened with it is is that Discharge, they created a sound from from the rhythm and to give it a bit of clarity, maybe for people who don't know anything about it, but what seemed to happen? I mean, we had punk, you know, punk, you know, kind of came about in the mid, the mid seventies, you know, with the Ramones and um, you know, etc. From New York, sure. and you had the Sex Pistols and the Clash and the Damned, etc., doing something in the UK, uh, and you know, that morphed into you know, like what was the the beginnings of punk rock as we all know it. Yeah. Um, what what happened was really there was a second wave that 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 came in sort of around the turn of the eighties and and again it was happening on both continents really because you know you you had you know the the, the American bands like the Dead Kennedys and um, you know Black Flag and, and Bad Brains and and a whole host of others that were you know like cutting their teeth in the U.S. Um, and then over here you had like the, you know, the likes of um, Discharge and GBH and the Exploited that, you know, were, were creating, you know, like a, a more aggressive form of punk that was becoming known then as hardcore punk. Mm, mm-hmm. now, now, Discharge were kind of like, the, you know, the, the forerunners in this because they, they were really, I suppose, younger musicians that were coming from, you know, what we'll call the first wave of punk, but hadn't, you know, hadn't broken through. What this chat seemed to do is is that this chat released three EP records in quite a short scale of time. So, um, you know, EPs are like extended play singles sure. for, for maybe some of the listeners that don't know what that is. So you were in effect buying a seven inch record, but, you know, they'd have maybe four or five songs on them, you know. Yeah. And of course, with, with, you know, like a band like this, Jack, the songs were short and direct and, and fast. And, and really, I suppose, why it's become, you know, synonymous with them is that that beat, out of, say, the 12 songs that appeared on those three first EPs, but that rhythm is in, is in at least nine of them. <laughs> wow. So, so it's like, a, you know, it's like a consistency factor. Now, I don't know which way it came, you know, whether it was because the, another interesting factor here is that the guitarist of, of Discharge and the, the drummer then are twin brothers. Hmm. So I don't know whether Tez came up with a rhythm and then Bones, the guitarist, started writing riffs to that or whether the style of guitar riff that was being written just that you know, that rhythm suited it. 
but yeah. but either way it you know it appears in most of the songs so they've set you know a very consistent sound that goes with the rhythm and and you know discharge have, have proven to be a highly influential band i mean you know all the thrash metal bands and, and, and that you know cite discharge as an influence and it's those early records you know that 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 have a big part to play in it you know yeah um yeah and, all, and of course never mind the punk bands that followed them afterwards you know <laughs> it's like so i suppose that's why it's called the db now interestingly enough they weren't the first to use that beat. It actually was played, you know, like um, uh, the Buzzcocks used it beforehand. Uh, and when I was doing the documentary, I was I, I had to be very mindful of this because I put a little, you know, like a little sampler out before I did my documentary. I was just curious to see the interest in it or what people might, you know, like put in comments underneath sure. the video or whatever. And of course... You know, the first thing that was coming up with it was like, oh, you know, Discharge, you know, they, they didn't play this rhythm first. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the Buzzcocks played it before. And I thought, well, I know this already. But then I thought, well, if I'm doing the documentary, then I've really got, that's got to be included. Yeah. You know, it's, it's impossible for me to do a documentary on the DB and, and, and interview Tez Roberts from Discharge without me you know, including Buzz Cox and the drummer John Ma, you know? Yeah. But the difference is, Bart, is that the Buzz Cox, and as John points out, you know, in that whole early career, their three albums and the numerous singles they did, he only ever played that rhythm twice, hmm. you know, out of dozens of songs. It wasn't a staple part of their sound. But as I said, for Discharge, it was. It, w it became the blueprint. Yeah. Which that there's something to be said about that. Like if that becomes, you know, doing it a couple times is there's a big difference from it becoming the sound of your band. And it's kind of one of those drum beats that um, I feel like with punk, it's punk is kind of unique where the other musicians, the guitar, the vocals, the bass, everything can kind of do a million different things over that particular beat. The songs can all sound different. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? It's very uh you can change the tempo it's it's just one of those interesting beats where it, you can do it a million different ways and i know in the documentary you talk about um how you can play like straight through with your hi-hat hand or you can kind of syncopate and match with your hand with matching with your bass drum foot so there's a lot of ways you can you can make that beat your own yeah ex exactly right and um, and what you know the interesting part there and like you said is is there's so many variations is that you know that was another thing i wanted to do with the documentary because i seen you know with with the advent of youtube and social media there was a lot of people putting stuff out that i just thought well it's not factually correct mm -hmm. you know some would say you can only do it this way um you know you don't play it with a hi-hat you've got to play it with a crash symbol um, and I'm sort of thinking, well, straight away that's wrong because, you know, the first interpretation of it by Buzzcocks is on the hi-hat. Sure. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. um, but, you know, the, the key factor to sort of point out here as well, Bart, is, you know, why it's interesting is that Buzzcocks and Discharge, the rhythm probably stands out because both bands choose to use it as a drum intro to the song. Mm -hmm. So you know that both the songs have this kind of boom, boom, get at them, get them, get at them, get them, get that, you know, digga, digga, that, or digga, 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 whatever the fill is. Yeah. But you know, but you know, it who the band and the musicians who, who you know from both those outfits obviously felt fit to think, wow, that sounds cool. Let's use it as a drum intro. You know. Yeah. The other thing is, is that it, it, it is played in its most basic and crude way, which is the right hand following the bass drum. But you know why? It's because both of those drummers had only been really playing weeks before they were committing it to tape. <laughs> yeah. So you hadn't, you know? they, they just hadn't practiced it that much to get the yeah, independence. They had, yeah, they, they weren't developed drummers. They were, you know, they were, you know, young lads who just started playing that were just being as creative as they could be with their limited playing ability, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, John particularly points out, you know, how it came about and how he was just put on the spot because of the riff that was played to him. Um, you know, and, and it's as simple as that. 
But, you know, the thing is, is that regardless of that, the, the fact of the matter is this, this rhythm has gone on to to shape, you know, a style of music. And, and now it's, you know, it's, it, I mean, DB as a name isn't just a beat now. It's, you know, it's a musical style and a musical force even, mm. you know. And, you know, it's, it's you know, over 40 years old. So regardless of how it started, it, it of course, has been developed. And, and as you pointed out as well, there's so many ways of playing it. So, for instance, you know, the, and like I tried to point out in my other, um, you know, in my other uh, videos I've done afterwards, because, of course, I've done the documentary, The Birth of the DB, but then I've tried to do a, defini a definitive guide, yeah. how to play it, sure. you, know, pick, you know, taking it from its most basic raw style, developing it through maybe you know where you become more of a developed player and you can play it with say the more typical right hand um keeping a, a consistent quarter note pulse you know yeah on on, on be it the high at the ride or the floor tom um but then that you know i've done another video where i've developed it again playing it in a linear pattern you know so now you're getting into more modern you know drum rhythm concepts you know or what are popular you know like uh more modern drum yeah for concepts. sure yeah and the latest one i've done is playing it in in you know odd time signatures you know mm. <laughs> i mean that, so it's it's almost like that there's only so many different kind of patterns and rhythms that you could do and, and like you said earlier where it probably comes from africa and these you know or cavemen kind of things way back it's it's got that feel to it where again if you speed the hell out of it and speed up with it and 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 play it fast with you know distorted guitars and bass and vocals then it sounds very punk but you could play it in a, tons of different ways that boot da boot da boot da boot da and, yeah. and and get that you could make it more like you know uh tribal but that's kind of the coolest thing about drums is we're just like uh you know we're setting the foundation for everything to come on top of it of course and and, and the you know the other factor is is that you know looking back on it for myself when you play it in that most basic raw sense, it sounds at its most tribal because, you know, it literally is just meant about, you know, the power, the energy and the aggressiveness, you know? Yeah. As soon as you put, say, like a quarter note um, ride cymbal pattern, it smooths it out. Now, that's great, but it's not always what you want, you know? So, yeah. um, so it, it, it's, you know, it's just, it's really then a question of, what you're trying to do with it. Sometimes you don't want it to sound so aggressive. I mean, an interesting part, you mentioned Dead Kennedys. Well, you know, that the first drum of Dead Kennedys was very jazz influenced. So, you know, you could play a D, a D beat with a jazz right cymbal pattern. Yeah, um, yeah. And that would give it a different feel again, you know? Um, the thing is, is the faster it goes, to my mind, it, the, the more it, it loses its bounce. And, and you, you mentioned further back about the other rhythm that's very close to it, you know, which where you take the one bass drum note out, so you end up with do that, do that, do that, do that. Yeah. Well, that suits when you get, you know, when you're getting more to your 200 BPMs much better, you know? Yeah. Because that's... when you're kind of getting up to the do that, do that, do that, do that, do that, you know, it, it can start to sound, you know, like pretty clumsy when you play the DB. That's exactly right. And that's a good point to bring up because once you do hit a certain speed, that that boot da boot da boot da boot da it it does lend itself more to boot da boot da boot da boot da boot da boot da because it's so fast you just need that little bit of you know that air to breathe you know yeah so you you take that bass drum out and suddenly that fits better um and I suppose you know really that has come as a, a, an interpretation from the D beat you yeah. know yeah really but to my mind it's not the D beat. So, you know, it's, but, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's another rhythm. It know? is another rhythm. And I think the other punk beats that, and, and, you know, I hope it's funny. People are probably just driving, listening to us, like, m you know, make drum sounds with our mouths. But like, uh, it's, it's like that, that everyone always thinks of the boop, bop, boop, boop, bop, boop, bop, boop, boop, bop, or boop, bop, boop, bop, boop, bop, you know, fast, like, boop, bop, boop, bop, 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 Yeah, 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 it, yeah. The, those are obviously very different, but I feel like you kind of have this, like, in the punk drumming world as you are obviously a master of you, you have this like tool belt where you can like, you know, pull your different traditional punk beats 
from and then choose which one you want to use. Um, now, do you know it's it's not I know we're talking about the D beat, but those those more boop, bop, boop, bop, boop, bop, boop, boop, bop, did those those see, uh, that had to be kind of happening in the same line where, you know, if you're not going to play the D beat on a song, maybe you just do that fast you know, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, boot, da, boot, da, boot, da, like, yeah, it seems parallel, right? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, what, what, what it really is, is that, you know, when you're playing in, in, in really, you know, the more, what we, you know, it's now termed as hardcore punk. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, like, uh, um, you know, like your names and styles now, you yeah, know, yeah. you've got melodic hardcore punk and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But, and I mean, I'm, I'm keeping it within hardcore punk here more because the tempos are more, you know, they're more um, uh, linked with hardcore punk than, say, they are with, you know, pop punk, you know, sure. which does have fast songs like bands like No Effects and that. But um, a lot of it tends to be, um, you know, there's a lot more sort of, you know, like 4-4 four, four patterns, fast 4-4 four, four patterns as opposed to maybe the 2-4 patterns. Yep. You know? And, um, but the thing is, is what, what really shaped a lot of those patterns, you know, from the bands and, you know, and I'm going back to the sort of, you know, the, the, the early years of, you know, the, this period with DB and things is it, it was simply the guitar riff because the guitar riff was really the melody of the song. You know, somebody asked me to, you know, to describe uh, or, you know, to differentiate punk to hardcore punk. And I was like, well, you know, it, it it's it's more aggressive it tends to be faster and the singers you know that they, they don't sing you know yeah the tune you know the, i mean they do but you know the tune isn't held in the vocals that you know the melody really is the guitar riff mm-hmm. you know so if you like a really you know like a you know if you've got favorite songs by the like of discharge or gbh or um you know, even minor threat or mm-hmm. whatever from, you know, from Washington, D.C., the chances are it's the guitar that's carrying the melody. <laughs> hmm. You know, yeah. the vocals are, are, are you know, like are, are shouting the message, you know? Yeah. And so as the drummer, you know, you'll often find that the drums are very influenced by what's going on with the guitar. So if the riff is straight you're going to play one of those straighter, you know, you're naturally going to play one of those straighter rhythms. Uh, uh, and if it's kind of got the DB bounce, and I like to use that word bounce because I, I always feel the DB has a certain bounce to totally. it, which of course those straight rhythms don't have, you know, then, then you've got to be mindful which one you're going for. To me, it's a little bit like if you were playing Latin and you, you know, you, you, you mixed up the clave, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, the tune is in the 3-2 clave, but you're playing a 2-3 drum part. It, it, it's going to great. Yeah, it's competing. Where the, if the guitar yeah, is going ding da ding da ding ding da ding da ding ding da ding da ding da ding da ding then you're going to, like, <laughs> naturally exactly. follow it. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. So, you know, like any form of music, you know, that there, there are certain things you naturally adhere to just because it either works or it immediately doesn't work you know yeah i think with drumming and patterns and stuff you know you can talk about it and plan and think about what you're going to play all day but then the second you sit down and you start jamming it almost just all goes away and you just your body takes over and you start playing what's right for the song and this is obviously one of those cases where then you get your options of doing, you know, on the crash, on the hi hat. You doing, you know, your own style, but it's sort of just like it's inherent to like it's it just what comes out of you is usually the right thing. And it's you know the goal is to make people, um, you know, in in certain styles, it's more to dance in uh in in more punk genres. It's more to make people just you know, thrash and like (laughs) jump around, which is your goal. So that's kind of the beat and the speed that you're going to play at. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and what really happened was, you know, with, with, you know, the, the likes of, um, you know, discharge and, um, you know, one of my favorite bands ever is bad brains. Yeah. Um, you know, so, You've got the American side, you've got the British side, you know. So over here, we had the likes of Discharge and um, GBH and the Exploited, uh, you know, and a whole host of others. And, of course, at that time, you know, 
in the stage, you've, you've got, you know, bad rains and minor threat and black flag, as I said, and be away from Canada and, you know, again, a whole host of others that are coming through as that second wave. And, and interestingly enough, you've even got a band like Dead Kennedys who, you know, had started just a bit early, but they picked up on the hardcore thing. And, and you know, they, they went from their first album being very spiky and punky to doing In God We Trust, which is a full-on hardcore, you know, political assault, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and the the Dead Kennedys in particular have kind of a, uh, I don't know, they have some songs that are very, like, you know, punk, but they're not as, like, they might be slower or they might be more of like that, which is just a different, it's like you don't, I think it's almost kind of quote unquote punk to not care about playing what's you're supposed to be playing in certain styles and like just do what feels right for the song. But my God, his, it's DH, right? Who plays with the dead Kennedys. Man, his hand is fast. Like, I yeah, like the- he was great, but of course he didn't play on the first album. Okay, who was that? And he wasn't the first drummer. So the, the first drummer, um, that well, he went under two names. He was a uh, Bruce Schlesinger, okay, I think definitely Bruce, uh, and he also, you know, was known as Ted. <laughs> okay, he's the same guy. Got it. But he played on the first, you know, handful of singles on the first album, and he was very jazz. Um, you know, even when you see some footage with him, he's playing traditional grip. Um, and you can even hear the jazz ride in certain, you know, in certain songs by them, you know. So, it, you know, that that's a point of interest for anybody that might be listening to this. It's like, you know, yeah. you, there, there, there was jazz drumming going on in punk, in, in you know, in the early days of it. Yeah, well, um, that comes so, up a lot in this show is like how, you know, depending on when, you know, this would be how far back you go. A lot of times these guys were growing up influenced right. by jazz drummers. So it, it's cross genre that, you know, of course you're or, or their parent, their, their his dad or mom loved jazz and was listening to it all the time. And um, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and maybe, you know, the, the one thing I noticed with them. Um, you know the American drummers of the day versus the British is a lot. Of, a lot of them seemed a lot more schooled. You know, sure. um, you know that they, you know, possibly had you know teachers or good teachers. You know, so although they were young and and, and fully into the punk thing, they they had you know like chops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could actually. You know, I mean the yeah. chops may be raw, but but you know they could they they had energy and could play. And and going back to D H Beligro, as you said. He could play. Yeah. And so, you know, as soon as he joined, you know, suddenly Dead Kennedys could play super fast songs. You know, they had a drummer that could do it, you know. And and you know, and, and that was the difference. Yeah. Um, you know, it's quite a different style what how DH was to Ted. Yeah. I mean, Dead Kennedys are one of my favorite, you know, my, my favorite bands. And, yeah, for sure. You know, the thing is, is with all this as well, but as I you know, I grew up within it, so totally. You know, like I, I'm, you know, I, I I remember it as it was happening. You know, yeah, I can remember sort of hearing the Dead Kennedys thinking, "Wow, what's going on here?" It's you know, it's like a different band. <laughs> or I can remember first buying those Discharge records and thinking, again, you know, Jesus. <laughs> you know what's this? I've never heard a sound like this before. Yeah, and then another record re- is released soon after. Wow, mm. more of it! Brilliant! I can't get enough of it. You know, mm. and then another. So, you know, the reason that going back, part why I wanted to do the documentary was I thought, well, I kind of know this inf- You know, this information is is second nature to me. I can I can remember it, but again, stuff that I was seeing on the internet, you know, I felt was you know mis or ill informed. You know, yeah. it might have been well-meaning in some cases, but it was like, well, oh, that's not right. You know, um, that you know, so and so didn't play on that record, and in fact, that's not even DB anyway. It's a different rhythm. It's a different drummer. In fact, you know, mm. it might still be discharged. But so things like that made me want to go back and interview the key guys so that I could document it, you know, as as thoroughly as I could. You know, yeah, and and um. You know, people usually know this, that if you uh, I'll post the um, link to it in the uh, show notes here. But um, so let me ask you this. How does so if there's there's usually some like, you know, 
I don't want to say rules, but there's like some guidelines. You're typically following along with the history of this stuff where like you want to stay true to the the actual beat and how the people who, you know, were pl- originally playing it. How do fills usually fit into the D beat? Like I know you said that it would typically, you know, a song could start out with a fill, but is there any, I don't want to say rule, but is is it typically yeah. common to like, just put a fill in, you know, at the end of the, the, the four bar, you know, phrase, and then just keep going or, and what kind of fills would typically be played, uh, with the D beat? Well, it's interesting you say about the rules because, you know, I, I firmly believe that there are no rules, but that's another problem. <laughs> that's Some punk. people, you know, the, the punk police think there are rules, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, and, and, and that was another sort of myth that I wanted to, you know, to, to, to bust. Sure. Um, which I go through a little bit again in, you know, like, um, my more instructional videos about the DB. Yeah. But the fills, no, I mean, the fills, it's the obvious fills are going to be rudimental because that's how they were played by the young players, you know, basic 16th note flurries around the drum kit. Yeah. Um, how you want to approach it, how long you want to do it, it it's up to the individual, but. The, the, the fill factor doesn't really have its part to play as much as the rhythmical part, you know? Got it. Yeah. I suppose, you know, then it's just a question of phrasing. And, you know, the, the other thing, of course, you know, as drummers, we're, you know, highly, um, you know, we're highly in tune with what's going on with the drum parts. But for your average listener, they don't hear things like, what ride cymbal patterns playing, or whether you're even playing it on a ride cymbal or a hi-hat or whatever, they just hear the basic pulse, yeah. which is the thing we keep going back to that, you know, the original drummers played even with the hand following the bass drum. But that's what your average listener would hear anyway. So, so providing that part is being, you know, is uh, adhered to, and so I go back to meaning the bass drum and snare. To my mind, that's the only rule, you know. Yeah. After that, it's up to you know, it's whatever creatively you want to do. So even if some somebody may say there's certain rules for fill uh, for for drum fills, I would argue that point and say, well, there isn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and what what that what happens if you do a different fill? Like, okay, great, you know, there's you broke a you broke a quote unquote rule in a punk song that's what it's all about um now i i also i feel like this the d beat itself obviously you said it crossed over and you hear it in different kinds of punk but i also think that people use it in like more in the world of like metal and hard rock and stuff i mean like i think of like motorhead um which i guess could depend i mean they're they could also fit into the world of punk but i think you know what i mean they kind of cross into that heavy metal world but um how does that in the punk world, how does that feel for to people? I mean, again, it's like, what do you what do you do? There's no rules, but like, uh, how is that seen in the traditional punk world that it's being used in other heavy genres? I mean, I for me, it's I think it would be great more D beat. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, okay, so well, it, you know, that's a, a an interesting point you raised there, but as Tez points out in my documentary, and, and this is why it's good to you know to speak to these people is that. His biggest influence is when Motorhead and UK subs. Mm. So when he played, you know, his interpretation of a drum rhythm, he was getting it from that. So, you know, as as I point out, and, and I'll say it here now, you know, it, you know, the rhythm did not, you know, like wasn't invented in punk. It's, it it goes, you know, way further back. But sure. what I was trying to do was was to, you know, was to really focus on its origins within punk, you know? And of course, once I put the documentary out, people were saying, oh, you know, well, you know, it appears on this Diamond Dead song, and, you know, this band from Belgium, it's, you know, released a single in 1972, and I'm like, look, I know this, you know, I've heard it on Velvet Underground songs and all sorts. It's, yeah. You know, so we know that. Now, going to, you know, back to what you're saying, or asking, you know, with regards to Motorhead, well, you know, Motorhead, although, you know, they would only cite themselves as a rock and roll band. We know that they they really, you know, their foothold was, you know, was heavy metal or mm-hmm. heavy rock. But they were kind of like, and I, you know, again, I remember this bad. 
they were like the, the heavy metal band that it was okay for punks to like, you know, yeah. because they kind of got that punk thing going with them anyway, haven't they? And you know, and they, yeah, they they were, you know, I mean, Lemmy, you know, played a little bit for the Damned, and he was friendly with a lot of the punk bands, and the punk bands, you know, like all like Motorhead, and so by the you know by the time of Discharge, um, you know releasing their records you know there's a big motorhead influence in there the the interesting point of it is is that you know that when you listen to discharge you don't listen to them think they sound exactly like motorhead mm -hmm. but these days when you hear bands you know it tends to be like when i hear like you know like newer db bands now you know mm -hmm. I just sort of think, oh, they just sound like this church. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and I sort of think, well, do something different with it, you know? Yeah. Take it somewhere. You know, this sounds 40 years old now. It's, you know, try and do something different with it. That, which is why, you know, I'm trying to do these other videos where I'm doing it in odd times or just doing things that are more interesting and creative with the rhythm. Yeah, um, totally. But that's why, you know, like you said, you hear it a lot in metal because, you know, the likes of Metallica and, and all the thrash bands, well, you know, they were really digging bands like Discharge and GBH. But, of course, they love Motorhead and Diamond Head and Iron Maiden. and You know, so it, it, it was all a melting pot from, from the period, really, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And it's, it's, all, it's all heavy and it's all building on top of each other. And um, I, I think that it's one of those things where now that people have heard you talking about it and heard the beat and hopefully watch the documentary, you'll start to like hear it more in songs and be able to point it out. Whereas, you know, maybe before it kind of washed over you without really knowing the origin of this particular beat being its own particular style. Um, now, you know, D beat itself um, is kind of, I mean, I know it's a beat, but I feel like it's considered a style of punk music. Is that correct? Like it, it's, 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 yes, it's like there's D beat bands, right? That's right. So do the D beat bands typically only use songs that have this particular beat? No, not necessarily. No more than say, you know, Discharge did. I mean, if we go back to Discharge, I mean, as I pointed out, those first three EPs, you know, pretty much cemented the style and sound. Sure. But after that, uh, Tez, the drummer, left. Uh, and, and, you know, he, he's not really played drums since. You know, he, he's, he's, he's um, uh, far more of a career as a guitarist and, and sometimes bass player. Yeah. And he's back in Discharge now playing rhythm guitar. You know, he doesn't play drums in the band. Hmm. Um, and so by the time that Discharge made their, what's seen as their, you know, the, 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 the really, you know, the pinnacle of, the, of, of their style and sound, they did an album called Hear Nothing, See Nothing, Say Nothing, which is about two years later, about 1982. They have a different drummer now, he doesn't play the D beat that much in, in, in the Discharge songs, you know? Yeah. He tends to play more of the other beat that we've, you know, talked about, or the straighter rhythms. Sure. So, now, I don't know, again, whether that was the influence from what he heard in the guitar riff or whether that, that he was just felt, you know, like comfortable playing those rhythms. So, even in Discharge, it's not just strictly D beat. Got it. Um, so yeah, these other bands, uh, you know, that are, have come from it, or you know, now under the, you know, like you said, the the the, 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 the flagship banner of DB as a musical style. I think that the key thing is they all refer to it strongly. Yeah. But but it's not, you know, it's it's not a hundred percent, you know, that it's Just in, that. in much the same way that, you know, when you listen to reggae, it's not all one drop, you know. No. No, totally. That's but, a great. But, but you know, if you're a reggae band, you you know you're going to have some songs where they where you play where the drummer will be playing one drop. It's just synonymous with the style of music, um, and I suppose that's the same for DB bands. You know. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Now and uh, and like you said um, before, because I want to take some time to talk about you personally and making the documentary and your background a little bit here as we kind of come to come close to the end, but. 
Um, uh, you know, it's going on today, right? Are you happy with how the landscape of punk is th- these days? You know, as a as a kind of an old school punk guy, um, what's your thoughts on the current world of punk? Well, I mean, you know, I'm super happy to see that all these years on, it's still going and it's stronger than ever. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, it, it's amazing, really, that you look at bands like you know, Green Day and the like, you know, well, I mean, Green Day in particular, you know, they're one of the biggest bands in the world. You know, it's, hey, I think a lot of the time people still see punk as some sort of underground, you know, you know, independent movement. Yeah. And that's still there, of course, definitely. But, you know, it really is in the, you know, the veins of mainstream music. Totally. And and that was the thing that, you know, I, I found, you know, of, interesting but also frustrating with, with with all of this was that i saw you know the whole thing with me being interested in doing something with the db more as an you know as a, an educator was i was sometimes going into you know like a you know like a drum summer camp and i'd mention something about the db and the, you know the drummers would be there sort of looking like what you know a bit perplexed and i'd be well what, you don't know they're DB? And I thought, well, you probably don't. You know, it's it's a bit of a specific thing. Yeah. But now, but then I also thought, well, why? You know, I mean, you know, if, you know, if you're a drummer, you and you're a drummer with with you know a certain amount of ability and skills, you wouldn't want to be like that and not know what a samba is, or sure. you know, as I said, or a you know, like a you know, like a, or a reggae one drop or, or whatever, you know. So why wouldn't you know a DB? Because to me, it, it's kind of now becoming a bit of a bread and butter part of rock drumming, you know? Yeah, it almost seems like people would have already, you know, you inherently play it. Like if you're learning drums and you're going down a page of beats that someone wrote out, like it's oh. likely this, it's likely on there where you've learned it, but you just maybe didn't know what you were doing or the background. Yeah, I, of it. I mean, really, you know, like, you know, all of the fundamental punk drum and it's rock drumming. Yep. It's just, you know, all the, the typical things you would, you know, learn in, uh, you know, run of the mill sort of rock drumming book or whatever. But, but the thing is, is that, you know, what differentiates and where you take it somewhere else is it, the energy, the speed. The intention, you know, yeah. and the aggressiveness. Yeah, for you sure. Know, that's what makes it different. And I think you mentioned that at the beginning. You know, it's it, it that's what separates it from being a sort of, you know, like a typical meat and potato style of rock drumming. Um yeah. so you're right, of course, you know, everybody will have played it, you know, in their sort of, you know, their first probably ten or fifteen uh bass from variation patterns in simple four four rhythm. Yeah. But uh, you know that that after that, it's 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 how you use it, how you adopt it, isn't it? I oh, mean, you yeah. know, you could you could say that the bass the bass pattern and the snare pattern is what's become you know prevalent in drum and bass, you know, right. at a different tempo. Uh, yeah, you know, totally. it's, it's it's the same thing, but that's drum and bass. You know, doesn't sound like the you know no. it's exactly the same rhythm <laughs> yeah and that's the coolest thing about drums is how we are uh as drummers so you know we take our you know these things that we just hit like these four yeah. or five drums in front of us and can make so many different things with with different tempo and different you know style and yeah. different limbs being involved um so i mean if if, if you play that you know at a more moderate tempo and play it in the shuffle you know and you go boom da do da you know it's essentially the same pattern but you know suddenly then you're into you know uh you know like a strong r and b by you know yeah that's a funny way to look at it now so um you teach lessons as well so let's talk about you for a little bit here so so people can obviously take they can learn from you you because you clearly what i like is that you um um i like you mentioned before that a lot of, you know, punk drummers would just get their drums and then within a couple of weeks, they're in a band and playing out live, you know, thrashing and stuff. And that's the coolest part about punk music. Mm-hmm. But you are obviously a guy who has clearly a lot of knowledge and as a great teacher. So why don't you maybe give us a little bit of your background and some tell us about some of the people you've played with, because there's some big names. 
Yeah, well, to begin with, you've described you, you described me there <laughs> <laughs> with what you were saying. You know, I mean, I was one of those. You know, got my drum kit, was in the band, and thrashing out. You know, as soon as I could. That's the thing that I loved about that form of music. It's you know, it's 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 something that anybody can partake in. You know, yeah. Um, but it's really about where you take it, isn't it? It's about where you take it. Um, you know, and if all you're ever doing is just thrashing about or whatever, then. You know, to me, after a while, you know, I, I wouldn't have wanted to continue like that. I wanted to develop. I wanted to learn about different styles of music. I wanted to play different styles of music. That 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 was something that really interested in me, and um, and I wanted it to be pretty extreme. And I suppose that comes from, you know, the initial punk affiliation that I was introduced to with the punk and the reggae. You know, yeah. So, you know, so that was something that I was big on. Um, but I, 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 you know, where I live, because I come from, uh, you know, Anglesey in North Wales, which is a bit of the back end of, you know, of nowhere, so to speak. It's, you know, it's a lovely place, but, sure. um, you know, it wasn't somewhere that's a hotbed for, you know, rock and roll, you know, and certainly not <laughs> punk. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, um, you know, so there was, there was no teachers there. I mean, I would have loved, you know, to have had guidance about the teacher. I mean, my, you know, my thirst for knowledge was, you know, was was great, you know, but I just had to do like a lot of people from that period where I just had to try and learn myself, listening to records, you know, trying to play parts, forming a band, playing with other people. Um, and basically, I, you know, I took it from that. And uh, I mean, I started playing the drums because of the dam. That, that was my, you know, that was my moment, you know, watching the dam on telly. And seeing Rat Scabies, and of course, twenty years later, I ended up playing for him. Yeah, so, I was going to say that's you know, that's a pretty full circle kind of thing because yeah. there's a lot of cool pictures of you playing with uh, the Damned. Yeah, and, and so I've ended up playing with a lot of those bands. It, it started off with, you know, when, when I, I first got into my first touring and, and band, which was a band called English Dogs. And then I played with a band called Sacrilege. And these were more sort of second wave bands that, you know, that come from the likes of Discharge and stuff like that, you know. So we're talking the sort of mid, the mid 80s here. Uh, and then I ended up, you know, like fast forward a number of years, you know, joining the Damned. And then I played for the singer Morrissey. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I played for New York Dolls, wow. Killing Joke. Uh, I played for Sham 69, Cockney Rejects. Uh, I, I, last year, one of the greatest ones I had, or two years ago, I played for HR from Bad Brains. Wow. So that was an amazing, you know, an absolute amazing experience for me, you know, because I, I can't emphasize enough how much I love Bad Brains and how influential they were. So, uh, so I've got to play for a lot of cool bands that I grew up and liking. Uh, you know, that, there's been a lot of other bands that I've worked with and played for and done sessions and tours with, but. Keeping within the punk frame, which is what we're talking about here, really. Uh, you know, they'd be some of the, you know, the more known names. Oh, I played for Conflict. Mm. And, and I played, I did a world tour with Steve Ignorum from Crass, where we did a whole tour playing in an exclusive Crass set, you know. Wow. So that was all amazing as well. And all very different style to drumming. You know, I mean, I could do a whole show on that. You know, it's like... You know, the, the Ratskabe style of drumming, which is very much, you know, coming from Keith Moon uh, to Ginger Baker, you know, who and Cream style, those style, that style of drummer to, to Killing Joke, which is much more post-punk and like, you know, heavy disco and heavy dub. Um, you know, the cross style drumming, it's like a cross between Boys Brigade snare drumming and, and jazz and rockabilly. <laughs> You know, yeah, they've, they've all got completely different touches. And then, of course, I played for the prototype punks, really, you know, with New York Dolls, you know, mm. where there's a lot of swagger, um, you know, and then playing with bands like Conflict and, uh, you know, and Sacrilege, which is much more the more brutal, hardcore style of drum playing. Yeah, man. Well, it's cool that you have the ability, obviously, from your, you know, you've played for a very long time, but you kind of. Uh, clearly you you enjoy learning about your craft and knowing what you're doing where you can um you know to be a professional high level drummer you kind of need to do that and i'm sure you could 
not that not you'd really want to, but you could sit behind a pop star and hold your own and play perfectly well just because you've got such a good foundation um, as a as a working touring session studio drummer uh, i'm sure well, you can play with anyone yeah an interesting point with that was when i when i joined morrissey that kind of almost was it i mean yeah, you know he's really. not a, a pop star in the sense in in what you know in that term but, sure. but he is very much a star uh and you know an icon and a legend and um you know when you put when i played that gig that required all of that you know I mean, you know, some of his songs, you know, that they're, they're, they're almost close to pop songs. You yeah. know, they're beautifully crafted, simple little poppy songs. Yeah. But he does rock out. You know, he has, you know, there, there are moments in the set, you know, where it gets quite rocky. I mean, the band that I played in, which were, you know, the long-term musicians at the time, were a bunch of rockabilly musicians. You know, I mean, you know, they lived and breathed rockabilly. But they were doing the same thing, you know. So, you know, you, you would be... One minute you'd be playing a song that's, you know, quite rocky, not as rocky as what, you know, I sure. could know or could play, you know, sure. you know? Yeah. But, but rock, you know, rocking out, you know, quite heavy. Yeah. But the next thing you're playing, you know, like a song that's kind of more rooted in a ballad where you can see people in tears, you know, in the audience. Yeah. You know? And then you might play a song that's kind of got a more typical rockabilly shuffle feel, you know, as I was pointing out about the D beat and the R and B thing, yeah. um, for instance. So, yeah, and, and I enjoy that challenge because, you know, I, I'm not, you know, like, I'm not just about sort of like, you know, the punk play. And I mean, I like the extremity, you know, I mean, I like, you know, I like working on, on my jazz playing. Um, you know, I love reggae playing, and when I went and did that tour with HR from Bad Brains, it was it was a you know pretty much an exclusive reggae set, mm. you know. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, I love that, and, and and actually, you know, at one point, you know, like I I played with Kenny Joke, and a week later, I was playing with New York Dolls. Quite different drumming, really. Yeah. Even though both the band you 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 would put under the sort of you know the the punk banner, you know. <laughs> totally. I mean. The, the the end all be all kind of like takeaway that I get is like, you know, um, you're a drummer, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's it, right. you'll, you'll play the, for the gig. And I think that's what, but there's also a side of it. That's cool. When there's a guy who's like, no, I only play the D beat or I only play thrash metal. I only play double bass and I'm not playing with, you know, uh, a singer songwriter. But I, I think for you, for your, your example of just your, your career, You've done a lot of awesome stuff, and um, I highly recommend people watch your documentary, which I will share. It's 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 not, you know, two hours long. It's it's relatively short. I mean, you can kind of throw it up on YouTube and just watch it. And uh, I loved every minute of it. And um, I am just super happy to have had you on the show and kind of you know talk to, to someone like you who we haven't really gone like i said earlier we haven't gone into the punk world on this show very much um and i think there'll be more to come down the road with punk and metal and reaching out to other genres and then also going to uh, classical rudimental drumming and you know civil war we'll, we'll cover all kinds of stuff <laughs> <laughs> but um on that note man spike i appreciate you taking the time to do this and uh, we've got a pretty far time difference so i'm glad we could make it work um and Thank you, my friend. I appreciate yeah, yeah. you being here. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. And just to let, you know, your listeners know if they want to check out more on me, uh, it's, you know, spiketsmith.com is my website. And, and just, you know, Spike T. Smith on YouTube or Facebook or, you know, Instagram or whatever. And uh, and just to finish off with that as a point of interest, you know, currently what you're with what you're mentioning there with the differences, I'm now, you know, I'm, I'm playing in the death metal band. <laughs> cool. So you know, that's been that, that's another interesting curveball, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, but yeah, you know. So thank you. I, I've really enjoyed myself, Bart. So thank you, and I and I hope that you know people do check out the. You know, not just the documentary, but the follow-up bits I've done afterward, because that's what I'm interested in is where where it can be taken to. You know, absolutely. I I think it's I don't want to say funny, but I think it's just great that like for a guy who plays you know a lot of like aggressive music and is just you know 
really into heavy stuff that, you know, I feel like instantly we got along and just as drummers, very approachable and friendly guy. Um, so I think that's just the beauty of music is that people can, you know, just hit it off right away as drummers. And, um, and obviously I love punk music, but you know, I'm sure you'd get along with a hardcore jazz drummer just as much, uh, who has no interest in punk just because of our, our, our shared interests. And that's the, the best part of being a drummer. Absolutely. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Spike. I appreciate you being here. Cheers, Bat. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.